On September 17, 2013, Rockstar would publish a game that, within 24 hours, would become the fastest growing entertainment product in all of history. In its first three days, would cross $1 billion in revenue, and today stands as the most profitable individual piece of entertainment ever, and the second best selling video game of all time. On September 17, 2013, Rockstar would release Grand Theft Auto V to the world. The anticipation leading up to this game was something really special. Everyone wanted to get their hands on it and play it. Every new trailer dropped and every screenshot teased just made the wait more unbearable. But what was all the excitement for? GTA V follows three anti-heroes. Franklin Clinton, an up-and-coming street hustler, Michael DeSanta, a retired bank robber, and Trevor Phillips, a redneck drug dealer. Together, these characters tell an expertly designed and intertwined story of backstabbing, vengeance, and revenge. Being one of the best games ever made, there is so much to talk about, but today, I want to take you back to launch day. That exciting day 10 years ago that so many of us couldn't wait for, but haven't really experienced in quite a while. Before we had our PS4s and Xbox Ones, our PC ports and current gen upscaling, we had the Xbox 360 and the PS3. The Xbox 360 release contained two discs, one containing a mandatory download and the other running the game, while the PS3 version only had one disc, taking advantage of the PS3's native Blu-ray capabilities. To relive the launch of this legendary game, I'm going to be booting up the Xbox 360 and taking a trip to Los Santos. Ludendorff, North Yankton. The story starts off nine years before present day, and we find our crew kindly requesting to withdraw from their checking accounts at their local bank. This is set up as a hostage situation, so it's imperative that we do not kill the hostages. Even though no one outside would know, the lives of these assholes are important to the mission for some reason. So after we corral them into the closet, we call our buddy Detonate, who sadly passes away after being glued to a safe. Now that the safe is clear and open, it's time to get serious and head towards it ready to take. Grab some moolah, and then BAM! Michael's at gunpoint. This officer here has a gun to Michael's head, and here we're introduced to the mechanic of switching characters. With his best friend's life on the line, Trevor pulls off some precise shooting and gets Michael out of danger's way. Now we gotta take cover and get the fuck out of here. It's here that we're welcomed to the world of GTA V. All these cops were called in to deal with us. The thing that's fucked about this is that based on the decorations inside the bank, this is right around Christmas, so we're just murdering all these cops right around Christmas. The aiming locks on to the nearest person, which is a standard for shooters played with joysticks. The lock on is really strong, but I think it makes the game more fun casually. It can be turned off though. Now that we're out, we gotta hop in our ride and get out of here. These cops just won't fuck off though. They're chasing us on the road and we got some decisions to make, fast. We gotta get these cops off of us and beat a train. Our driver just got his mind blown and now Michael's at the wheel. With our new designated at the helm, we're looking okay. Driving in this game is beautiful, and could be made into a racing game on its own, which it has been in a sense with all the races you can do both offline and online. There's a lot of rushing going on from the game telling us about some train, but there isn't any train coming. What a load of horse shit. The second train though is coming, and getting hit by it's a scripted event. So here we are on our last legs, literally, and Michael wants to stick to the plan and look out for our chopper. I don't know why the cops lost us after we got hit by the train. After the train went by, couldn't they just have seen us right there on the other side? I don't know. But from out of view, a sniper picks off Brad and Michael. Trevor doesn't want to leave them behind, and finally, the dumbass cops figure out where we are. Trevor tries keeping them off, but decides that his best shot is to make like a banana and split. One baby hostage situation later, and he runs off into the distance, away from the cops. Following this scene, we find friends and family mourning for poor Michael. Also in attendance is an oddly familiar looking sniper rifle holding mug. And off in the distance, a Michael Townley can be found watching his own funeral, smoking a cigarette. And with that, this is Grand Theft Auto V. A theme spread throughout the game is the stability of Michael's mental health. He's frustrated with a lot in his life, such as his son, who, instead of taking opportunities, sits in bed all day, smoking dope and jerking off, despite his only father figure being a killer and a bank robber. Many times during the story, you can stop in and talk to great value Bob Ross about recent things you've done. I think the visits to the shrink that you can attend throughout the game is such an awesome addition that lets you see into Michael's head more than you could from just him interacting with his family and associates. I always found Michael to be my favorite character, and I think this is part of the reason why. So here we are, Los Santos. I want to talk about how it looks. So obviously, it looks a bit assy. This is vomit compared to the 4K ray tracing high res GTA 5 ports of today. But at the time, it was one of the most graphically impressive games out there, despite the heavy aliasing and 720p at 30fps. It was just so exciting to play it, nobody cared, especially after an intro like that. The hype up to launch didn't disappoint, nor did the excruciatingly long loading screen leading up to the intro. But here we are outside the beach. This is where we meet Franklin. Franklin and his buddy Lamar are running repo scams for a criminal salesman. Just by chance, him and Michael cross paths a while before they would end up working together. So we're looking for two fancy schmancy cars. A little sneaky here, a little sneaky there, bam. We gotta get these cars back to our boss Simeon, but why not make it a race? 
Reckless driving. It's as synonymous with GTA as the color brown is with dirt. You can't see one and not think of the other. Atop this hill here, we're introduced to special abilities. Each character has their own special ability, and Franklin's is the slow-mo driving. It's the best ability by far, and it's the most useful. They do a great job of giving us a little tour of Los Santos, taking us through a lot of the major roads, and some areas we'll see later on in the story. It's also a great showcase of how alive this game is. There's always cars moving and people walking, advertisements, buildings, parks, and letterboxes. There's just so many things to run over, it's great. Lamar is doing some inhuman AI driving and never hits anything. You're meant to stay behind him this whole time, but you can get ahead of him last second and kick his ass. Lamar is one loud, dramatic, brash, crazy, greedy, shooter motherfucker in the back type motherfucker, so he bounces. We gotta lose the cops. Okay, okay. Now, we gotta head back to Simeon and give him the car. Back at the repo shop, we see Jimmy, Michael's son, looking to buy a new car. But Simeon, being a shit, is trying to paint him as a racist asshole. Which Jimmy is, but not right at this moment, kinda. Anyway, we're playing along with it and trying to get Jimmy to buy a car to help out Simeon. Bickering back and forth, and Franklin gets pissed and fucks up the car. I mean, he helps out Lamar and drives him back to the crib. We safely get home, and Lamar shares some frustrating information with me. He suggests that if I change the hairstyle I've kept for some time, I would find myself some amount of suitable sexual partners. He then brings up a previous woman I've associated with, and says that had I listened to him, she would reach out to me despite her preferring a high-level doctor she's been dating. So this is our safe house. Ours and Auntie Denise, of course. Here we can save, store cars, and even watch TV. But enough of this house shit. Let's see the outside world. A major part of the fun of Grand Theft Auto games is the dicking around. In between missions, you're obligated to cause havoc and murder indiscriminately. The world of GTA pauses for you and continues when you want it to. Here I am atop this building, hiding from the cops. Hiding from the cops is always a pleasure. Once you're out of their view, there's a timer that counts down before you're completely off the hook. So when the stars are blinking, stay away from the cops or else they'll start the timer again. The easy way out is always just to kill yourself, but when you die outside a mission, you'll respawn at the hospital. It'll cost you some money though, and where you respawn depends on where on the map you died. Something I've noticed in this version is that the aimbot by default is much stronger than in other versions. You can change it in settings, but for this video, I'm keeping everything on default. Anyway, back to adventure. So Franklin is getting a bit tired of the same old shit. He wants to move up in the world, but just as he breaks it to Simeon, it's revealed that Franklin has been awarded Employee of the Month. Whatever though, he wants out. So he's opening up to Simeon, who doesn't give a shit, then BAM! Lamar pops in, and he's not too happy. This Employee of the Month shit is getting controversial. Well, spitefully, we're gonna get this bike back for Simeon anyway. Fuck it. We head off. Short drive, and here we are. Vespucci Beach. So, we apparently don't want to make a scene. The idea is that we want to be casual walking through here, and then check the garages to find the bike. Then we take the bike, get it back to Simeon, and our job is complete. However, there's like a million ways you can fail this mission before you even get the bike. Lamar won't walk unless you stand right next to him because he's a pussy. So keep moving along right next to your buddy, holding hands, and eventually, you make it to the back where you get confronted by the gang who owns the bike. Before long, Franklin gets a gun and a shootout happens. These shootouts are always fun. They always have this great design where they want you to do specific things that add more action to what you see and do. They're all designed to be fun and satisfying. Now for the bike and... You can just shoot him before he gets away. Get the bike and head back to the car wash. This bike handles like shit. So shit that I got into an accident. And died. The way you spawn back is the worst because you don't have enough time to shoot him right away, so now I gotta chase him. Well, that's fucking annoying. Finally, I get him again and back on track. Except I'm not. If you fuck up like I just did, you get to experience the biggest nightmare you could have in a GTA mission. I don't want to restart, so I'm trying to figure this out. The bike is above this weird crevice, and it's a pain in the ass to get there. Okay, so I get the bike, and now... Fucking damn it. A million goddamn tries later, I get the bike off, and finally... So, we meet up with Lamar, who's pissed. He takes the bike, says fuck you to Simeon, that's it. Well, things ain't going too well for Franklin. Back to Simeon, and he gives us our next job. James DeSanta. Well, that sounds familiar. So we hop in the whip, and head off to Vinewood Hills, but we get interrupted by a call from Simeon. He's all pissed, because Lamar took the bike. Well, now we got all this shit to worry about, but fuck it, let's get this over with. Before we get to Michael's home, I want to talk about the cinematic camera. If you press B while driving, the camera switches to the cinematic mode, which looks cool, but it's like, impossible to drive like this. There are some times in the story where the car will autopilot in cinematic mode, but it's not always, and because of how difficult it is to drive like this, it just ends up looking hilarious. 
We arrive at the home and have to be very sneaky. We have the option to knock out the gardener, but I've decided to spare him. Hop up on the roof and inside. Now we have to make our way to the garage without alerting anyone. There's three people we have to watch out for here. Jimmy, Tracy, and Amanda. You can make a lot of sound without getting noticed. I was testing it out, but there is a limit. I believe it's about how far the sound travels, and once it reaches Amanda, the mission ends like three seconds later. So hop in the car, and please ignore the body-shaped bulge in the blanket behind you. But wait, it's Michael. So Michael here is pissed, and he knows what you've been up to. He asks some questions before making you take him to Simeon. He looks fucking pissed. So once we're there... I'll put two rounds in the back of your skull and do it myself. Fucking badass. So we follow his wishes, and BOOM! Michael thanks Franklin and beats the shit out of Simeon. Good. Fuck Simeon. So now we get to play as the bad boy gun, slightly worse boy, Michael. But for right now, let's continue a little bit more with Franklin. Something cool I want to talk about in this game is the mechanic of texting and emails. Throughout the game, you get texts and emails from people, and you can reply to them for some character interactions. Sometimes you can even call them and get their opinion on recent story events or initiate certain missions. It's a really cool thing in the game that I hope carries throughout the rest of the series. Just a very clever way to get more character interactions to players who want to see them. I want that beer Michael promise, so let's see what he's up to. He's just hanging out, ignoring his family when he starts explaining to Franklin his situation. But fuck it, let's get that beer. On his way out, Michael gets a call from Jimmy, who tried selling his boat for money, but now has been kidnapped and needs help. So scratch that beer, let's get that boat. So we're on to them, and it's this highway chase now. We get Franklin on the boat, and he's knocking the fuckers off. The challenge here is to stay on them and aim at the same time, which can be a bit difficult, but it's still fun. Jimmy's a stupid fuck and starts hanging off the boat. Catch him, now we get Franklin, and the car breaks down. Splendid. Now we gotta take the car to the shop and get it fixed. Michael's all pissed at Jimmy, and Jimmy thinks he's pissed for all the wrong reasons. So he takes a cab home, and now me and Jimmy gotta fix the car. What? What? For fuck's sake! So the repair is free this time, but all the other fun stuff costs money, which I don't have. This is meant to be a tutorial on how to use the Los Santos Custom Shop. Now, we take Jimmy back home, and bam, mission complete. So Jimmy says that he added me on Life Invader, but he didn't. He's not on my friends list, and I don't have any requests. So what's he talking about? What a lying sack of shit. Any of Franklin's friends that aren't characters in the game don't have actual pages. They all just say they're private. Why would they say they're private if I'm friends with them? Isn't the point of being friends so you can see their pages? So let's take a look at one of the several strains of side missions. Strangers and Freaks. Every main character has their own Strangers and Freaks. They're a nice distraction from the story every once in a while. Franklin's first Stranger and Freak is Tanya. Tanya and Franklin go way back and the more you play your missions, the more lore you get. There's one problem though. Her missions are boring as fuck. Every mission you drive a car, pick it up, and drive it back. It's meant to be a bit mindless, and you're meant to be listening to the dialogue about Tanya's man that you're doing this for, but it's really bland, and none of them are something you're gonna look forward to playing, let alone replay. Anyway, let's check out what Michael's up to. Oh, his wife is fucking her tennis coach. Well, let's murder this prick. We pick the absolute worst car in our vicinity, and chase the guy and narrow him down to this house up in the hills. He's trying to make peace with us, but Michael's not having it. So of course, the sensible thing to do is tie a hitch to his support beams and tear the fucking house down. Takes a bit, but eventually the whole place comes tumbling down. Now, we're on our way home, but we get a call from some woman screaming at us. She's saying that Michael's a dead man, and that some guy named Martin Madrazo is gonna come after us. Well, Michael's not too concerned, but it doesn't take long for us to get shot at. Now we gotta take out some ballas. Depending on how well your aim is during this mission, Michael might suggest that you swing by the shooting range to improve your shitty fucking aim. Now that we're back, Michael realizes he might have gotten himself into some hot shit. Well, that gets confirmed when a car pulls up in his driveway and he gets questioned by the mentioned Martin Madrazo. He kindly beats Michael with a bat and then requests that Michael pay him $2.5 million to repair his home. So from this exchange we find out that the tennis coach was just staying there, and Martin Madrazo is a big crime boss with a lot of power and connections. Michael concludes that his only option now is to connect with an old friend from his glory days. So he gives him a call and makes plans to meet him at his home in Murrieta Heights. So some backstory on Lester is that he- oh wait, so Michael calls Dr. Friedlander a shrink and updates him on some life events. He's concerned about where his life might be headed and how his addiction to chaos is affecting him. Well, we'll have to stop by for a session soon. Anyway, Lester and Michael haven't spoken since Michael's quote-unquote death. When Michael faked his death, he had to throw some people under the bus and get some people killed, but we learn more about that later in the game and when we get to Lester. 
What's important to know right now is that Michael never sold out Lester, and Lester was never known to have anything to do with Michael and his posse back in the day. Here we are at Lester's house, and we give him a nice warm, hey, how you been? We catch up. Michael mentions his predicament with Martin Madrazo, and Lester recognizes the name. Anyway, now that Michael's back in the game, Lester needs a favor. He wants us to infiltrate the Life Invader headquarters and mess with Jay Norris's prototype. Well, before we do that, we gotta dress the part. So let's hop in the car and head to the Suburban. We need something geeky. The stupid bitch cashier suggests we go for a vest and some cargo shorts. So we pick him up, and now, off to headquarters. We let Lester know that we're almost there, and he says that we should have no issues getting in. So let's hope he's right. We pull up and park, and now we wait. Some nerd comes out, and he's complaining about shit, but Michael isn't having any of it, so he flicks his cig and cuts it short. We follow him in, and bam. The inside of the building is like a big joke aimed at the people it's making fun of. Upstairs, we gotta help him clear his computer before we can check out Jay's phone. I get that the joke here is that there's a bunch of porn ads on his computer and we gotta launch the antivirus software, but as a guy working for a major tech company, shouldn't he know how to launch an application? Just clear the fucking ads and click it, you dumbass. And that was all he needed. What a stupid fuck. Anyway, now we can go and check out the prototype. Pop in the whatever the fuck and now leave. Now we gotta get home and watch the keynote. We let Lester know and now we go home and watch. Tracy's watching Famer Shame in the living room, but she can go fuck herself. It's Michael's turn. I want to take this time here to appreciate the effort put into the TV. You can straight up sit here and watch this entire episode of Famer Shame and it's great. It's all satirical and they did an awesome job making it. Anyway, the keynote. Jay goes on about stealing data and docking with your friends, and then he awaits a call. You give him a call, and BOOM! Jay fucking dies. Well, that's that. Lester calls, and now that you did him a favor, he's ready to pull off a heist. There's some setup, but things are in motion. I want to start to wrap things up, but before I do, let's go check in with Dr. Friedlander. Or, no way we can't because fucking Amanda got arrested. We go help her out, you know, steal a cop car, pretty basic, get her home, and she actually thanks us. Now off to Friedlander. Michael wants to talk about what's been going on in his life. He's back in the game, and he's worried that he's gonna get into some big trouble. Now, on top of his issues with his family hating him, he's got a Mexican mob boss on his ass, and he's setting up a heist to get out of debt. He's not happy, but the chaos makes him feel alive. He's aware of what he used to be, and what he's become, but no matter of how self-aware he becomes, he never stops being miserable. There's a lot to get off his chest, but... That's really all we have time for. Maybe next time. This is GTA 5. This game is terrific and has been since it came out. Today, so many people just whine that GTA 6 hasn't come out yet, but honestly, I can still have fun playing this game forever. The characters, the location, the story, it all culminates to one of the best experiences and entertainment you can have. And that's why it's the highest grossing entertainment product ever. My point in making this video is to take you back to the launch day experience and what it was like to open the game on launch day and play until you were too tired to stay up anymore. These characters and this story will be iconic up to the launch of GTA 6 and far beyond it. GTA 6 has quite the record to beat, so honestly, it's hard to say whether or not it will actually beat it, but it will definitely be interesting to see. Obviously, when you compare this gameplay to what we have today, it looks a lot crummier, but you'll still have fun. The only other thing there is to talk about is the iFruit app for iOS and Android. Here, you can just view the manual, check out the social club, order cars on Los Santos Customs, and some other small things. There's also this little game in it called Chop the Dog, and it just lets you play these little mini games with Chop that increases his stats and lets him learn new tricks in game. The iFruit app was also available for the PS Vita. I don't know why. Anyways, GTA 5 is awesome and always will be. As always, thank you for watching.